Lynn Nygaard. I'm the director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture. And today, this is our inaugural colloquium, virtual colloquium. Um, and we're delighted to welcome Dr. Randy Ingle to the CNBC and to our virtual Emory. Um, Dr. Ingle is professor of psychology at Georgia Tech. And um, I, you know, I, I'm not gonna go into the story, but I encourage everyone to read your academic trajectory story um, on your website. It's really, really interesting, but you received your BA from West Virginia State University and then um, your doctorate from the Ohio State University. Um, Dr. Ingle began his career at a little place, King College yep. in Tennessee, and then um, ended up joining the faculty of the University of South Carolina and was there for a number of years before moving to tech as the chair of the Department of Psychology. Of course, Dr. Ingle has re accrued numerous honors and I'm not gonna be able to um, list them all, we would be here for the entire hour, but I would just um, mention that um, Dr. Ingle, Randy's been elected the a fellow of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, he received the first APA Division III Lifetime Achievement Award. And um, with respect to um, sort of Productivity, he's in a different, in addition to numerous chapters and co-edited volumes, he's uh, published over a hundred journal articles and received funding from a variety of different agencies pretty much continuously for his entire career. Um, Randy's research investigates the nature of working memory and what causes limitations in working memory capacity. Um, his work includes how working memory uh, operates in real world cognitive tasks and how um, working memory capacity and cognitive control relate to fluid intelligence. Um, uh, Ran Dr. Ingle's talk today, I'm going back and forth between Dr. Ingle and Randy, uh, but uh, is um, entitled to the ability to control attention, the secret sauce in the relationship between working knowledge and fluid intelligence. And um, I just wanna say a few words about how we're gonna to operate today. Um, and uh, I think it's, uh, we've decided to go ahead and have questions um, entered in the chat function during your talk, you know, and if there's some, you yep. know, sort of a series of questions of clarification and I'll stop and ask you those. And then at the end of the talk, we can raise hands and actually have um, people can unmute and, and ask you questions if that sounds okay. Right. That's fine. I, yeah, okay. I usually encourage people to ask me questions right in the middle. Deets and I will monitor the chat okay. box okay. and um, yeah, we'll, I'm, we'll I'm, stop you. I'll unmute and stop you and then we can that'd get That would be great. I'm, I'm okay. good with interruption. So okay. I, this is, you know, uh, I talk, it's an informal kind of process for me. So are we yeah. ready? Yes, and uh, join me, everyone, in welcoming <laughs> Dr. Ingle. Yes, um, and right. thanks, Randy. There we go. Okay, let's try um, How about that. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so you see my title slide? Yes. Okay, very good. Well, first of all, let me say I, it's, it is a, a real honor to speak to you. And I've got this work has been funded by the Office of Naval Research for the last 10 or 12 years. It was funded by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research for probably 10 years before that. Uh, but you know, the funding from NIH and NICHHD, uh, this work has been funded by a number of different agencies. And the work I do, and you'll see hopefully in a little bit, it couldn't, you just can't do this without funding because uh, most of the studies that I do are five to 600 subjects. Each subject is tested for probably four to eight sessions over different days, sometimes over a full year. And in each of those sessions, it's a two hour session with, you know, so just lots and lots of data on lots and lots of people. And we can't get them as volunteers, so we have to pay them. So funding is absolutely necessary. Uh, down at the bottom of that slide, what you see is that all of my papers are available at my lab website. I put them up almost immediately after they get copy edited and, and put in galleys. Um, I've, been fortunate never to have been sued by Elsevier or APA or any of the other agencies about putting my stuff up, but I just think it's really important. I also uh, have a history of putting 
the tasks that we use and make them available. And so uh, it says there that the tasks are available from the same website. The tasks that we've developed over the years have been translated into 22 different languages. I mean, it's just amazing to me that, that some of the stuff that we've done over the years is people in, in Iran are using our task and, and, and Azerbaijan, I and mean, with all the difficulties those people have, and they're doing, somebody's doing work on working memory or attention control is amazing to me. Um, but all that stuff is available and I, I, I'm, I really, transparency has always been hugely important to me. So I try to make everything. Now, even our preprints are available on Psych Archive. So before we even submit a paper out of my lab now, we post it on Psych Archive. So uh, a paper that we just had come out, I'll refer to it a little bit later, it's called the Toolbox paper. Uh, and it just came out in JP General. And since we had posted it on Psych Archive, before we even submitted it, it's been downloaded almost 900 times already. <laughs> so, so I think it's a, a useful thing for my students and for the work, as well as making the work uh, transparent. So uh, my, the initial question, a question I've been interested in in a long time is, is what is the responsible for this really strong correlation that we find between working memory capacity and cognition at many different levels? And I started off working on just the nature of working memory and it, and it soon became clear to me that working memory was highly related to a lot of different things and one of which was fluid intelligence. And it's that relationship that's really occupied an awful lot of my attention over the years. But it's also been clear to me that that you know, trying to understand the why of that relationship was was critical, and so I've tended to use a combination of experimental and differential approaches, much in the way that Lee Kronbach argued in his 1957 APA address. Um, he argued for these two parallel tracks of uh, uh, of psychological research, one of which is experimental, one of which is differential, and he argued that those two tracks rarely ever me that people in one rarely refer to the work in the other but we, we really try to use both approaches in my lab and it's it's uh, it's sometimes a very fraught enterprise um, and it can lead to faulty conclusions to be honest with you and I, I've shown that in, in our own work on several occasions but this question of what is responsible for that strong correlation and and the answer to that is given in the title of this talk and I've come to the conclusion after almost 40 years of doing work in this area that is really about attention control. But let me start with something that's much more general than that. And I'll start with something that's called the CHCH model of intelligence named after Jack Carroll, John Horn, Ray Cattell, and Don Lo Hebb. Most people don't put Hebb in this category They'll, or in that title, they just call it CHC. But interestingly enough, there was a paper published uh, several years ago that showed in correspondence between Donald Hebb and Raymond Cattell, that, that Hebb actually gave, talked about this before uh, Cattell ever uh, made this uh, distinction. And I, I just think it's it, the, this distinction of two different types of intelligence really relies a lot on Hebb's work, particularly the brain stuff. And so what I show you there is a graph and it's, it actually comes from the WACE and it's the, um, uh, verbal scale and the performance scale on the waist as a function of age of the person doing taking the test. And what you see there is the verbal scale, which I will call crystallized intelligence after the CHCH model, and the performance scale I'll call fluid intelligence. And what you see is that the, the crystallized intelligence, in this case indicated by verbal, but a lot of different, it's basically everything that you've learned from your environment, that it stays high over the you know, over the lifespan until right at the very end. And, and I would argue that if in fact you measure this, what I would say the correct way, uh, you would see a, a different pattern. And that is if you measured crystallized intelligence, not from birth, but from death backwards, what you would see is that it remains exceedingly high, probably goes, keeps going up until the, the last six months of life, this thing we call the terminal drop. Crystallized intelligence, you know, is very, very long lasting. But what you see with fluid intelligence, which is indicated by tasks like the Raven, it's uh, novel reasoning, uh, problem solving, sometimes planning. But what you see is that 
you get this peak at about age 22, and then it starts to decline slowly at first, but starting at about age 40, it starts dropping very precipitously. I always show this graph to my, the students in my introductory psych class on the first day. Uh, part of it is to intrigue their interest in, in these two different concepts. But then I point to that, uh, that data point at about age 70, and I say, that's me, so be gentle. Um, so I think this probably provides the best evidence I could think of for a distinction between these two types of intelligence. Arguably, fluid intelligence is the biological side of intelligence. Uh, it is, uh, there's strong heritability argument for it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's um, uh, we, we have a pretty good understanding of brain mechanisms and, and uh, it's, it's a hot area of work. Crystallized intelligence is, is largely what you've learned from your environment. What the model argues is that crystallized intelligence, your crystallized intelligence at any given age, is a function of your fluid intelligence at the time you learned that. So fluid intelligence is really critical. Uh, a lot of my work over the years has focused on this nature of fluid intelligence. I'm less interested in, in the acculturated knowledge, the crystallized intelligence. If we, the next slide shows a, a figure from a paper that we published in 2004, which looks at the relationship between working memory capacity and fluid intelligence. Now this is a structural equation model. So let me, let me uh, uh, talk about it a little bit. Uh, Lynn, can you see my mouse? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I'll, I'm going to ask you what you, what you can see and can't see. And so, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me describe this a little bit. Again, it's a structural equation model. This study had uh, two to 300 people in it. It's actually a relatively small sample size for my lab. Uh, these are the tasks that are used to indicate working memory capacity. And here we've got operation span, reading span. These are all complex span tasks. In the operation span, you see an, an arithmetic string like is six divided by three equal to two, yes or no, and then it's followed by a letter, L. And the person has to solve that very simple equation and then, but they're going to have to remember the letter. Uh, these are all modified versions of tasks, the first developed by Pat Daneman and Daneman, uh, Pat Carpenter and Meredith Daneman at Carnegie Mellon. These numbers on the left are the, uh, the error terms and, and the, these, are, uh, these are actually the loadings of these tasks on this construct. And what you see, these, the highest could be one. And so these are really quite high loading. So these all fit together in a very coherent manner for this construct that we call working memory capacity. Now, this link here is, well, over here's fluid intelligence. And these are all of the different measures that we use to indicate uh, fluid intelligence. There's the Raven. Lots of, lots of different things that we used in this study to indicate that. And we wanted to pull off, that was, that was specific to verbal reasoning and that was specific to spatial reasoning, so that what's left is common to all of them. And, and so what you see there is this number here is the 64 can be thought of as the correlation between working memory capacity and fluid intelligence. Now, that has been replicated in labs all, all over the world and, you know, in populations across the world, lots of different ages, uh, that relationship is quite strong. And the, this, this particular figure um, led some people to conclude, large experimental people who I think didn't quite understand the psychometrics of this, that working memory capacity causes fluid intelligence. And that's not what these, these, uh, this graph uh, means. You can have these arrows be in almost any direction. Structural, structural equation modeling is confirmatory analysis. It does not do a good job at, at hypothesis testing. And so this, it's, it's a uh, misunderstanding to say that the, the relationship is quite strong. The relationship is quite strong between them, but that does not mean that working memory capacity causes fluid intelligence. In fact, it led some people a number of years ago to think that, well, if we increase working memory capacity, we should be able to increase fluid intelligence. And, you know, those people have spent millions of dollars trying to show that working memory training improved fluid intelligence. Uh, 
They've spent millions and millions of your mother's tax money on that. And that that's just, they just don't show that that works in my opinion. So, but this relationship is quite strong and it varies between 0.6 and 0.8 depending on populations, but it's always a very, very strong relationship. So my question is, why does that occur? You've got these measures of working memory capacity. You've got these measures of fluid intelligence. Why are they so strongly correlated? Well, I have argued that these two constructs, fluid intelligence and working memory capacity are highly related, but that they in fact reflect two contradictory processes. What I argue is that the, the tasks that we think of as working memory capacity tasks reflect largely maintenance of information. The, the fluid intelligence tasks reflect largely disengagement. So while, while one of these sets of tasks is, is try, depends on your ability to hold on to information, the complex reasoning tasks require on your ability to block information. Now, how's that true? Well, if you look at the, the Ravens test, uh, you've got uh, a bunch of different uh, things that are happening, uh, wallpaper kind of test, and you have to pick uh, an item that fits uh, uh, the, uh, that fits a, a blank in, in the screen. I should have shown a picture of the Raven. And, but once you've tested a hypothesis on the Raven or any of these fluid intelligence measures, if it's wrong, you now have to discard that. And you should not retrieve that hypothesis again. And unfortunately, low ability individuals tend to re-retrieve the same hypothesis over and over again. And so the, the good thing to do there is to disengage, to block, to inhibit, to prevent retrieval of that information. I call it disengagement uh, because it, I, I really, it could be any of those processes. It could be inhibition, it could be uh, a flagging uh, a particular hypothesis to not uh, recall. But those two things are, are really contradictory to one another. But what they have in common, I argue, is that both processes, all of the tasks that reflect those two processes require attention control. That's the top-down signal. So therefore, the high correlation is a result of individual differences in ability to control attention. So let's talk about some of the measures we've used for attention over the years. One of these is the, the old Stroop task. Um, and Everybody, I think, probably knows what the Stroop is. You're you're to read the you're to say the color of the ink in which the item is presented, and and to not read the word. So this is red. This one is green. This one is green. This one is red. But at some point, you you know you have to, a conflict between the the word that you've read hundreds and thousands of times probably coming to mind. You have to block that and to say the color. Uh, uh, of the ink in which the word is, is printed. So the Stroop is a, is a conflict-based task. And the score that you use to reflect this is the time it takes you to do an incongruent minus the time it takes you to do a congruent trial. And that turns out to be important. The way the Stroop and many of the other conflict tasks that are used to study attention control are, are done is to take a different score between two reaction time trials. And that can present a problem. And I'll deal with that again in a moment. Another task that's used is something called the flanker task, more commonly called the Erickson flanker task after uh, Charles Erickson at the University of Illinois who developed it. And uh, I used to say that to get tenure at the University of Illinois in any area, you have to have used the Erickson flanker task at some point because it's used for virtually all areas and clinical included. Uh, and in this task, you're going to see five items, and you have to press a key to co that corresponds to the middle item. Um, and the, the trial that I will describe to you is one in which you have to press an S key because that's the middle item. But you've got congruent information on both sides. That's compared to a congruent trial in which you've got S's on both sides. And so here again, we would subtract the time it takes to do the congruent trial from the time it takes to do the incongruent trial. And um, 
that is, it's a, it's a reasonably sensitive measure of attention control. It's been used extensively. Both the, the Stroop and the Flank have been used extensively in the experimental literature. Um, but, but these two tasks uh, both suffer from requiring the use of different scores. We just published a paper last year out of my lab in Psychological Bulletin where we laid out the real the difficulty in using different score measures in differential research because they're extremely unreliable, different scores are. And you get huge differences in speed accuracy trade-offs. So an awful lot of what we've done over the last couple of years, and I'm not gonna talk about much of any of this work today unless I'm, I'm asked about it, has really been to come up with tasks that rely totally on accuracy because totally accuracy-based tasks, particularly those that are adaptive or that use a threshold approach are incredibly sensitive, incredibly reliable, and incredibly valid, as, as I'll show you uh, at the end. Now, the other task that we often use to, to assess attention control is something called the Anna Sakad task. Anna Sakad task has been used in lots of uh, developmental and psychopathology work as well. Um, the first and we use a number of different versions. The one I'm going to show you here, these are actually two trials that um, 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 so in this, in this study, you see the crosshairs there. This, this is an eye movement study. So that reflects where the, the subject is looking at any given time. At some point, one of these two boxes will flicker. And when that box flickers, this is the anti saccade version of this task. Uh, in the pro saccade version, if the box flickers, you're to immediately look at it. Now, pro saccade performance does not depend on attention control at all. Uh, your nervous system has evolved to look at things that blink because things that blink afford uh, movement in a James Gibson affordance kind of way. And, uh, uh, Things that, uh, that flicker suggest movement. Things that move can eat you, you can eat it. So evolution has prepared you to look at things that blink. The antisacod is what's important, however, because in the antisacod, if, if this box blinks, you're to immediately look over here. If you even glance a little bit at the thing that blinks, that's an error. And I'm going to show you two trials. Uh, one of them will be an error trial, one will be a correct trial. So this is... There was, this was the error trial. And so what you saw was the person looked at the thing that blinked um, and instead of at the, um, uh, the one on the opposite side, they then get feedback saying, nope, you looked the wrong way. And this is, oops, let me back up. This is the error trial again. And that was correct. Um, the Anna Sakad task is totally an accuracy based. It's, uh, it, it's not measuring reaction time. It's an accuracy based task. And we have repeatedly shown that this task, as simple as it is, and in and, and this version of it, you know, there's, there's nothing to, no button to press. You're simply to look at, at, a, at an object opposite to the side of the screen where a, a flash or a blink occurred. But it is incredibly reliable and, and it persists, the effects here persist over days and days as we've shown. And it's incredibly valid in that pre predicts performance in a wide array of complex real world cognitions. So these are the tasks that we've used to measure um, attention control. Uh, so, I'd like to first talk about attention control as it's related to something fairly low level in terms of cognition, and that is sensory discrimination uh, and the relationship of sensory discrimination to fluid intelligence and working memory capacity. This idea really goes back to Charles Spearman and, and people in Europe who were interested in early psychophysics and in, uh, and in the role of intelligence. Charles Spearman argued that differences in intelligence were totally a result of differences in sensory discrimination. He thought that higher uh, intelligent people took in more information than low intelligence people. But 
There was very little work supporting that until just very recently, and Ian Deary in Edinburgh and some others have, have found some support for that. And so I was interested in whether this relationship was, was there. And so I was interested in the relationship between fluid intelligence and sensory discrimination ability and working memory capacity and sensory discrimination ability. And whether those relationships were due to differences in attention control. So the, we used a variety of tasks. One of them is something called line discrimination task where the subject sees two lines on the screen they're jittered, so they're never on the same plane. They're jittered, and they uh, we use a, a, um, a procedure in which we're, we'll make the task easier and harder and easier and harder to get at a 75% at a threshold, where 75% of the time the person is correct. This takes um, a, a little bit of time, but it's incredibly sensitive, and it gives us a single number which turns out to be uh, a really clean number for, for each subject. So this is the line discrimination. We also used a version uh, in, in this study with circles and the circles were of different sizes and they had to, to talk about the size of, tell us which uh, circle was the, was the largest. Here they press a button, which line is the longest. We also used two auditory tasks. One of them is the pitch discrimination task. Let me see if I can get sound here on this. Whether you'll be able to hear this or not, I don't know. And they had to press a button indicating whether the first tone or the second tone was the highest pitch. So we had two tones that were different in pitch or two tones that were different in loudness. So we had two auditory, two, two visual tasks. And, and it was really just getting two psychophysical thresholds uh, for their individual discrimination ability. And, and the real question was, well, is, is Spearman correct in that this has any relationship to higher order cognition, such as fluid intelligence and working memory capacity? And the answer is, yes, it does. If we look at the, the, the top panel here, what we see is fluid intelligence is reflected by the Ravens number series letter sets, three uh, common fluid intelligence measures we often use in the lab along with many others. And what we see is a strong relationship between fluid intelligence and this general discrimination construct indicated by those four tasks I just showed you. And what we see is that for fluid intelligence and general discrimination, that relationship is 0.77. For working memory capacity is 0.7. In both cases, what you see is, is that about 50% of the variance in general discrimination is accounted for by fluid intelligence and or working memory capacity. So you'd see these two, these two higher order constructs are highly related to, to, to sensory uh, discrimination ability. Um, these are, we, we found this in a, in a paper that we did a number of years ago. I honestly was cautious about that. I, it, does, it struck me as a pretty astounding uh, finding. And so I replicated it in another really large, larger scale structural equation modeling study and those are those two studies are coming out in uh, a paper in attention perception and performance um, uh, almost any day now. Uh, lead author is Jason Sukahara, one of my senior graduate students. It's a very very clean finding. We replicated it uh, with different tasks and so forth. Um, and so the question is, well, what what really causes that that relationship? Well, one of the things that we wanted to do here was to look at basically use uh, the Barron and Kenny mediation approach to say, well, if that, if fluid intelligence is strongly related to fluid and to uh, general discrimination ability, if we treat attention control as a mediator, if attention control is really important in that relationship, then the relationship between fluid intelligence and general discrimination ability should be reduced. It might not go to zero, but it should be reduced. And the same thing for working memory capacity. Let me repeat that. What we're using is attention control as a mediator between these, between these two constructs. And if that mediator is really important, then that relationship between fluid intelligence and working memory and general discrimination ability should be reduced. Well, it not only was reduced, but it basically went to non-significance. Uh, what you see is in fluid intelligence, 
There's a strong relationship between fluid intelligence and attention controls measured by the Anderson God, the flanker, and the Stroop. And that the attention control is a strong relationship to general discrimination ability. But now the fluid intelligence to general discrimination ability, ability uh, relationship goes statistically to zero. And the same thing is true for working memory capacity. So this really points out the importance of, of, of attention control as mediating these two large scale individual differences constructs. So what do I mean by attention control? Well, I think of attention control very similar to what Mike Posner's referred to as executive attention. Uh, it's your ability to control what you're attending to. Uh, Norman and Chalice uh, called it supervisory attention. Again, it's, it's controlling the contents of your focus. And I think of it as a unitary, it's a, a single kind of uh, uh, construct, domain general, meaning for both verbal, spatial, and all other uh, processing domains, uh, that allows us to organize specific lower order processes around a particular goal. So focusing attention on only goal relevant information and reducing distraction from goal irrelevant information. And that's exceedingly important that reducing distraction um, is exceedingly important. So where is this construct important? Well, over the years, starting in 1989, actually, I've demonstrated that working memory capacity defined by complex span tasks and so forth, many others, is really important to a wide variety of things. Well, I now, I'm, I'm absolutely confident that it's really not working memory capacity per se, but it's really attention control that's important for all of these relationships. So we can look at the relationship between a lot working memory capacity and a lot of higher order tasks. And I'm just going to go through these pretty quickly. Uh, so we have saved some time for, for questions. Um, I'll talk about a couple of these things. Um, this is a, a graph, by the way, that I, I, I started early in this, in this process on this, the studies of working memory capacity. And I started with just one or two things. And, and it's gotten to the point where I have to, I've had to drop some things off because the slide is so crowded. But we can look at the relationship between working memory capacity and reading and, long, and listening comprehension. It's a very, very strong relationship. And that is people who score higher on a wide variety of working memory measures do better at reading and listening comprehension at, here we went the wrong way, following directions, did a set of studies with uh, uh, first graders, uh, third, sixth graders and college students showing that the ability to follow verbal directions, to follow, read a map are all highly predicted by following directions. A lot of the work that Sue Gather Cole in England is doing now on following directions really follows in this line. It's a strong relationship between working memory capacity and following directions. We see it between working memory capacity and vocabulary learning, the ability to learn new vocabulary, uh, note-taking in, in a college classroom is predicted by working memory capacity, writing ability, complex reasoning. And this is really where the relationship between working memory capacity and fluid intelligence first came uh, to light. Uh, we also see, by the way, a strong relationship between working memory capacity and complex learning. And let me talk about that a minute. There are a set of studies that were not done in my lab, but they use tasks that were developed in my lab. And they were done by people like Pat Killinan and Valerie Shute uh, working for the Air Force down at Brooks Air Force Base. And what they did, uh, they brought people into, there was a, a, a huge lab at Brooks Air Force Base that was they had something like 80 desktops in this huge room and they brought people into, the, into these lab and these big groups. But in several of their studies, they hired people uh, to come in from the community. They were not Air Force recruits. And they gave them a week of instruction on learning to write a computer program in Pascal or something like that. And what they were interested in was what predicted the ability to learn to program. They gave them a huge battery of tests, everything that you could imagine that the Air Force would throw at somebody like that to see what predicted complex learning, that is learning to write a computer program. And if you ask my grandmother what would have predicted that, she would have said, well, probably algebra or math or something along that line. 
But in fact, the, the measures of working memory capacity accounted for the bulk of the variance in the ability to learn to program a computer. And um, that was really when I first, it first became clear to me that we were dealing something he, here with something here that was incredibly fundamental to, to a wide variety of human cognition. And um, it, uh, it led some people, such as Pat Killen, to argue that, in fact, working memory capacity was the same thing as fluid intelligence. That led to a whole lot of research. If they're not the same thing, as I've argued, they're actually diametrically opposed in terms of the processes, but they're highly related. Uh, in social psychology, um, it, it, a guy named Chris Bruin in England uh, discovered that working memory capacity predicted the ability to block intrusive thought. And this was relatively early, I think. So um, the idea that, that intrusive thought, the ability to block intrusive thought as an important aspect of, of psychopathology uh, is I think something that's become really important uh, because it, it is characteristic of a lot of different psychopathologies, uh, the ability to block depressive thoughts or uh, worry, that kind of thing. Those are all very higher order tasks, but we see the same thing in a lot of lower order tasks. Uh, the um, SDATs, uh, senile dementia, the Alzheimer's type. Um, this is a set of studies that was done by a postdoc of mine, a, a, a former student of mine who was on a postdoc at uh, NIH. Uh, and, and she was working in a study that had, that they were studying children of people with early onset Alzheimer's. So the subjects were actually children of people who had, uh, were suffering from Alzheimer's. The, the subjects did not have any symptoms that they could detect of Alzheimer's, but they were interested in what the, uh, the, the children of these subjects had that were not characteristic of people who did not have the alleles associated with early onset Alzheimer's. Now, this was a, one of those interesting studies in psychology. It was a true, true double blind study. The, the, um, the, the, the experimenter did not know who had the alleles associated with early onset and who did not. But the question was what tasks discriminate between these, these two populations. It turns out that these measures of working memory capacity did a pretty good job of discriminating those people who, who suffered from, who had the alleles associated with early onset Alzheimer's. Suggesting that these measures are very much like a canary in the mind, if you will, for detecting potential problems subsequent problems with, uh, uh, with cognition. We can also look at a lot of lower level tasks that are associated with working memory capacity. Uh, what we see is things like uh, attention deficit disorder, but not hyperactive disorder. I would refer you to Adele Diamond's work on this distinction. Um, we see vulnerability to PI, low working memory capacity. Individuals are much more vulnerable to proactive interference than are high working memory capacity. Uh, let me back up. This, this relationship, by the way, and I, when I first did the work on this, I, I did assessments of working memory capacity and, and looked at high and low working memory individuals. It turns out that when you do this in a full scale uh, structural equation model, that it's really not working memory capacity, but it's fluid, uh, fluid intelligence that can, that's the cause of this. And it's really the attention control variable that's, that's important to vulnerability to proactive interference. We see uh, in the old dichotic listening task, if we uh, have people listen, sorry, my dogs are barking. Let me, let me go shut my door, be right back. Okay, in a dichotic listening task, uh, this was done by uh, one of my former students, Andrew Conway, Nelson Cowan and Mike Bunting. Uh, and they had people listening to uh, uh, over headphones and they were to listen to words spoken in one of the ears and they were to shatter them. That is, they were, they were to say each word as it occurred in let's say the left ear. And there was another stream of words occurring in the right ear and they were to ignore those. 
And unbeknownst to them, they had recorded their the subject's first name, and that was one of the words. And the interesting thing about this study is you get one data point. After the task is over, you ask the subject, did you notice anything in the ignored ear? And the question was, do people, did people hear their name? Well, what this idea about attention control argues is that high working memory individuals have better attention control and therefore they should be better able to block the information coming from the ignored ear. And that's exactly what Conway, Cowan and Bunting found is that low working memory individuals were more likely to report hearing their name than were the high working memory individuals giving support for this idea that what this working memory measure is really, uh, what's really important about these measures of working memory capacity is inattention. Um, now, what I would suggest is that if you look at, at theories of working memory that are based on some number, such as seven plus or minus two or four plus or minus one, uh, you'd never think to do this study because why would that, that have anything to do with whether somebody hears their name in an, in an ear that they're supposed to be ignoring. And yet, if you think about working memory capacity as, as attention, that's exactly the study that you do. And so what we find is that there's a strong relationship between uh, uh, working memory capacity measures and uh, your ability to, and to, to block distracting information. We also see differences in the stroop which I'll talk more about later. Um, this is the, the stroop that I showed you before. Uh, we also uh, see differences in mind wandering. So Mike Kane, one of my former postdocs who was at UNC Greensboro, uh, has shown repeatedly that low working memory individuals are much more likely to mind wander, particularly in, in, uh, in uh, attention demanding situations like listening to a boring lecture on working memory capacity that you're much more likely to mind wander if you uh, have a low attention control. One of my other former students, a guy named Zach Hambrick, who's a professor at Michigan State, has shown that working memory capacity uh, is strongly associated with your ability to multitask. High, high, high attention control, high working memory individuals are much better at multitasking than are low attention control individuals. And, um, we, we're doing a lot of work on that for the Navy currently. The Anna Sakad task I showed you before, another very, very low uh, order task that is predicted by measures of working memory capacity and more specifically measures of attention control. There we go. Now, with, if we think about working memory capacity as a trait variable, which I do, uh, we, can, we have a pretty good understanding of, of brain mechanisms that are important. Uh, we know that prefrontal cortex is important, anterior cingulate, basal ganglia, all are implicated at some level. And this is a hot area of research right now, looking at all of these different structures and their importance to individual differences in working memory capacity. As an aside, one of the problems here is that you need to test lots of people to do individual differences studies. And so what that means in this case often is lots and lots of scans. And so I'm involved in several different studies right now that are probably going to involve well over a hundred scans. And so you can see the, the time and the money commitment for something like that. We also have a pretty good idea about the neurotransmitters involved. So it's pretty clear that uh, dopamine and, and the different dopamine transporters, uh, some are more important than others. Maybe seroton serotonin, but I think more and more I'm convinced serotonin is not part of this, this equation. Uh, that, was, uh, um, that was first implicated because of work with, uh, with, with children and attention deficit disorder. Um, but I think it, it's largely a dopamine issue. We also have a reasonably decent idea about genes that are involved here. And so we, there's a long list of possibilities. The catecholomethyltransferase gene, the Compton is a, an, a, an allele that 
is important in the regulation of dopamine, the dopamine transporter alleles, brain-derived neurotropic factor. These are all implicated to various levels. There's no one single uh, allele that accounts for all of this, but you know, some of these are you know, as high as 10% variance accounted for, which in genetics work is, is pretty high. So we have a reasonably good idea about working memory capacity, attention control as a trait variable. But it turns out that we can also think about working memory capacity as a state variable. And I make the comparison here to working memory for, uh, between working memory capacity and um, the way that Janet Taylor Spence thought about anxiety. So people clearly have a trade anxiety level, but we also have a state anxiety level. Well, working memory capacity is both a state and a trait variable in my opinion. And so what I'd like to do is to give you uh, one or two examples of how this is as a state variable. And much of this work uh, is, was not done by me. Um, I have the people listed here who did a bunch of this work. I did a lot of the work on sleep deprivation uh, and, and some of the others, but all of this other work is, was done by, by other people. So for example, let's look at sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation is exceedingly important to all of us. I haven't been on a plane since the pandemic started, but I, in a typical year, I would log 100,000 miles easily on Delta. Uh, and in a lot of us international flights, a fairly lengthy flights, you know, you go from here to New Zealand, which I, I did a lot, uh, you know, you're talking about in a, a 15 to 18 hours in the air all at one time. But there are lots of other situations above beyond uh, flying where your, your life is really depending on somebody being well rested. Uh, I had a, a couple of my uncles were truck drivers and you know, and, and truck drivers historically, they got paid for, for being on the road driving. And so they did lots of things to, to keep awake and some of those things involved drugs of various kinds. But you think about when you're, dri you're driving down this highway and, and you pass this truck you know, at any given time, you're probably 24 inches, 36 inches apart, maybe max if you're passing this truck. And if you're each doing 55 miles an hour, you know, that's, that's a very, very small margin for error there. And if this person happens to be dozy uh, and, and sleep deprived, that's, that's a bad situation. Um, I did a study uh, early on with uh, this group of people. These were medical residents at uh, the University of Minnesota School of Medicine, looking at uh, the effects of sleep deprivation in residents and uh, the way that uh, residency is designed, that the nominal purpose of residency is for people to do a lot of learning, but they tend to pack learning in the latter part of a shift. And that shift can be, I mean, the, uh, the uh, the hospitalization, hospital organizations specify how, how long shifts can be and how many hours somebody's supposed to, to work in, in a given week. But what they don't say is that when you're not working, you have to be asleep. And, and one of the things that we found in our studies there was that at least half of our subjects, half of the, the residents were young females with children. And you know that those people are not getting sleep all the time when they're, you know, when they're home. So this is a, a, a problem that is uh, really endemic to a number of occupations and, and medicine is one of those. I will say that in, uh, uh, I see, I show here a, a student who is sleep deprived, clearly an issue. Um, I did a study at, down at Brooks Air Force Base uh, with military pilots. And we were interested in the effects of sleeplessness and we kept people awake for the, uh, 36, 30 to 36 hours. And they came into the lab at, at the end of a day that had, they'd been awake all day. And these are all highly experienced military pilots. Uh, there were, it was a small inn, there were only 10 of them, but they were highly experienced pilots. And they did a battery of tests every three hours. And one of the tests was this four axis simulator that you see here uh, that simulated uh, all kinds of uh, weather conditions. Uh, and it had the unique ability to present motion and visual conflicts 
during an, an almost entirely automated simulator flight profile. And so there would be conflict between the instruments and what the person saw out the window. Um, there's a lot of, uh, lot of evidence that, uh, that, uh, that John Kennedy Jr. died in his jet plane because he, he believed his eyes and not his instruments and that led him to fly his plane into the ocean. Uh, so that's a real problem. And so we, and this battery of tests that we gave them every three hours, part of it was on this flight simulator, but we also gave them a, a battery of other tests. Uh, again, there were 10 pilots, they were relatively young, but they had extensive hours in flying. So they, they ranged from 207 hours in the jump seat up to 5,800 hours. That's 5,800 hours in the jump seat in control of a plane. Uh, so these are all highly ex experienced expert pilots. Uh, and we were particularly interested in their performance in the second 15 hours of the study. That is after they've been in the lab and deprived of sleep uh, for that length of time, how do they do on all of these different tasks? What we were particularly interested in was what predicts performance on this simulator task, on the flight simulator. Now, let me just say that nobody wrecked the simulator, right? But what we look at is deviation from perfect performance on the simulator and what predicts that. And that's really been a problem in the military uh, and in aviation in general and finding a task that really predicts sleep-related error. Self-report is incredibly uh, unreliable. Uh, you ask pilots and, and you know, I, most pilots, and I know a lot of them, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they all uh, have a little bit of the Tom Cruise top gun personality in them, regardless of whether it's a male or female. And, and they're very loath to tell you that they're sleepy. So you need some assessment that does not rely on self-report. One of the things that we found to be quite good was something called a psychometer vigilance task. And in this task, it's a really simple task. The subject is looking at a computer screen, there's a bunch of zeros on it. At some point, these zeros turn into a millisecond clock and it just starts going up one digit each millisecond and they're to press a button as soon as that begins to keep that number as low as possible. If their mind is wandering, if they're, if they're thinking about something else, if they're looking at something else, then they're going to miss this and this number will become quite large. The other task that we used was something called was the operation span task, which was the working memory task that we developed in my lab that I told you about before, where subjects see an arithmetic string and they, have to solve that and then remember a letter. And what we found is that these two measures, uh, they each have some unique variants. That's what the 15 and the 11, that's unique variants, but they also shared a lot of variants. The critical thing is that these two scores together accounted for 58% of the variance on that complex simulation task. Again, it's an extremely low end, but it's with repeated measures and we see that these attention control measures predict performance very well in this very complex task in the face of sleep deprivation. So in conclusion, uh, this initial question, what is responsible for the strong correlation between working memory capacity and cognition at, at many levels? I argue that the secret sauce What's really the critical factor is individual differences in the ability to control attention. To control attention, to keep certain task relevant thoughts in the focus of attention, but to avoid distraction, both from externally generated thoughts, such as, oh, pretty butterfly, or internally generated thoughts like, what are we doing after the talk tonight? Or what's for dinner tonight? From capturing the focus of attention. Both of those are really important. And um, I think there's some interesting work to be done somewhere along the line to see whether, in fact, internally generated and externally generated thoughts are, are equally important in predicting success in complex cognition. I think it's not just cognition, however, it's that this ability to control cognition is, is it really reflects something more general. It's the ability to control attention and it's the ability to control your emotion and your behavior as well as thought. 
Both of those are extremely important. Now, the question might occur, why is this relevant to Off Office of Naval Research, the uh, Na Navy and the Air Force and others that have funded, I've been funded by DARPA and by the National Security Agency. I can't tell you about that work, but it, it was interesting and important. Why is that relevant? Well, let me tell you about two projects. One of them is the ASVAB. The ASVAB is Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. It's given to every military recruit across all of the branches, including the Coast Guard. And that, that is these tests that's used to select individuals for particular jobs in all of the branches of the United States military. Uh, it's also given to about a million high school students a year who use it for uh, high school counselors use it to, to make recommendations for students. Well, it turns out that the ASVAB is highly loaded on crystallized intelligence. It's really acculturated knowledge. And I would argue that it's not going to be useful in predicting performance in highly dynamic and changing occupations. That is occupations where the material is rapidly changing, where you're constantly doing new tasks that require problem solving and, and, uh, and complex thought. So the Navy approached me about doing a study about applying our measures of attention control to the ASVAB. And so they, uh, our first project was they wanted to do it in lab. So we, we looked at, we gave, uh, 178 people that we had selected from a big study that we had ongoing on attention control and brought them back and gave them a version of the ASVAB. And then we also gave them three multitasking tasks. So we had uh, a measure of multitasking at the construct level. It turns out that the ASVAB predicted multitasking pretty well, but that the measures of attention control added 20% variance to the prediction for multitasking. And that's important. If it predicts 20%, you can add 20% incremental validity to the test of the ASVAB, you're talking about a huge impact on the American military. And so the second part of the study is that we're looking to see whether we were testing pilots and air traffic controllers at Pensacola at least we were until the pandemic shut down their classes, to see whether uh, our measures of attention control improve the, the predictive validity for pilot and air traffic controllers. Now, why would that be important? Well, it takes $350,000 a year to train a pilot. It takes about $100,000 a year to train an air traffic controller. So you can spend three years on a pilot, and if they, if they wash out, and 10% of them do, then you've wasted a million dollars. That's just gone. Uh, air traffic controllers, you've not wasted as much, but the washout rate for air traffic controllers is 30%. So you're, you're, you're losing a lot of people that were badly selected. One of my program officers at the Navy says that if we show the same benefits here as we showed in our lab study, that that would save just the Navy, $500 million every year in selection. For every pilot that would wash out, if we can reduce that by, by for every one, we reduce the, uh, the, the cost of the Navy of a million dollars. So I think this work is really important. I think we're onto something here that is theoretically important. I think that what I, I, I wish I had the, the time and the energy and the resources to look at how this affects things like emotion control, because I'm convinced that this att these attention control measures are equally important in the ability to uh, control one's aggression, for example, or uh, control one's attention to uh, uh, in, in a situation that's not cognitive at all, but involves uh, behavior and, and emotion. Thank you, I'm finished. Thank you, um, Randy. That was great. Um, um, I we're we can take some questions now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's uh, odd not to get any feedback, right? Uh, yes, that's right. Yep, that's okay. Yeah, I took a little so, more time than I thought. I did. 
one thing about sharing my screen is I don't have a clock here, so I was I went a little long. Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. So um, we have a, a variety of people on. They have their cameras turned off, but if anyone would like to ask a question, just raise your hand and um, don't be shy. Ah. There, oh. <laughs> there we go. There's somebody. Robin, there's Robin. Robin yes. Uh, um, turn turn you... your mic on, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Randy. Um, thank How you. Are you. So interesting. And I really wish you had had an opportunity to talk about how you think this is related to emotion regulation as well. But I have a really kind of low level question. Yeah, um, yeah. When you were well, talking. Well, I have, Robin, I, I have a lot of thoughts on that. I don't have any data on that. You How's have any that? emotions about it though. <laughs> I have strong emotions, yes. <laughs> um, the sensory discrimination, really yeah. interesting. Um, so you talked about at least two domains, um, auditory yeah, and yeah. perceptual. Are there correlations across those domains? Is there- Yes, there are. You... Well, there are, and attention control eliminates those, that correlation between auditory and visual, right? Really? Yes. Isn't that important? Yes. Yeah. It does. It does. That's so interesting. It is. So <laughs> how do you think about that individual difference then? Well, I think it's about attention control is some is a, okay, uh, this is a, a, a message here, right? So it's a propaganda. Uh, it's election season, so that's okay. Uh, I think attention control is a fundamental aspect of our cognition, thought, and behavior. And emotion, I really do, and and when we're put in situations where uh, we're faced with conflict, with multiple things we could be doing, with distraction, all of that, then it becomes hugely important. It is what Daniel Kahneman calls System Two. System Two can't happen without attention control. It's not important in what he calls System One, automatic. You know, where an event occurs, I respond the way my nervous system, the prosaccade condition. You know, something blinks, I look at it. Well, attention control is not gonna be important there. And in fact, I need to not control it, just to let it happen. And that means I, I'm less likely to get eaten by a saber tooth tiger, right? And, uh, but in, in the, it, but so what's common to vision and, and audition, I think performance in those tasks is really the, the individual difference in ability to, to attend, to focus. Now, why would that be important? Interesting question. And these studies are so demanding of time and money. So that study that uh, I showed you data from actually two studies, as I said, I found it once, it was, it was such an amazing finding, I wanted to replicate it, so I did. There's probably six or 700 subjects in those two studies combined. I mean, it's, it, so if I had unlimited resources, what I would like to do is to answer the question, so what is it? So if I'm listening to two tones, it's how I prepare to encode each of those tones, right? Am I really attending? If, if, if I'm talking to you, am I really listening to you? I'm paying attention to your face, to your gestures, gestures important, all, all of those. Or am I sort of mind wandering away and sort of listening to you a little bit? That's the difference. Well, the same thing is true for auditory and visual tasks, I think. It is really your ability to, to, to attend, to focus attention, and to maintain it during the task. It could be encoding the event, the first event. It could be encoding the second event. It could be in some kind of comparison between them. It, you know, when I get to the second event, I now have to remember at some level my representation of the first event, right? And now, it, is it different between whether two events, uh, whether events are sequential or simultaneous? And the answer is yes, I think it does, you know, but those are things that I can't, I, I don't have the data to speak to because, you know, I, in each of the studies that I do here, that I talk about, I could go down that rabbit hole for hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour, okay? And I just, I can't do that. I'll be 74 in December. I, you know, I, I gotta do what I wanna do now, okay? So. Um, hi, yep. it was, that was a really awesome talk and thank you for being here. I just- You're had... Tiffany Lowe, is that it? I'm seeing yes. your name. Okay. Yes, um, I was wondering, 
as you mentioned earlier that there was a trait variable and then it could also be a state variable is attention control something that people can like change or is it something that is like encoded in their genetics see that's a really good question and i thought a lot about this but again don't have a lot of data so I, i've got to i got to go off on a tangent here for a moment so I got involved in that issue with working memory training. And my very first grant with the Navy, the program officer called me up, I'd submitted this proposal. And he said, there was just this paper that came out in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by Susan Yockey and John Janitas and some others arguing based on your figure from McCain et al, that working memory capacity causes fluid intelligence. And so they want, they did all of these studies trying to train working memory capacity, and they made an argument that they improved fluid intelligence. He said, I'd like to fund your proposal, but I want you to replicate that study first. And see, is it really important? And I said, well, okay. I mean, I wanted the money, so I, I'll, I, I, had, I had glanced at that paper, but hadn't really read it. And I, so I, I not only went back and read the paper, and it's a PNAS paper. I'm now on the editorial board of PNAS, so I can tell you. They're, the papers are really short and cryptic and you don't have a lot. And that one was, it was four pages. So I bought the dissertation on which it was based at the University of Bern. And it turns out that there were all kinds of issues. So for, they, they just to make a, a very, very long story short, uh, Susan Yockey had done something like 25 different measures and only found that a, 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 an impact of of working memory capacity on four of them, but it was a really, it was a weak study. So anyway, so I, I called the program officer back and said, all right, I'll do this, I'll replicate it, but I need to do it right. First of all, they had no control group, no control group. How do you do that? How do you not have a control group? And, and so uh, I said, I'll do it, but you know, these, it's gonna take some money to do this because you, know, you need a number of, a, a good number of subjects, you need a, to, to test for, uh, expectation and all this. And I said, you need control group. So that led me on a chase for the next four years and doing these working memory capacity studies. And repeatedly, repeatedly, I found when you do it right, you get no benefit. Work, working memory, people get much better on every measure of working memory capacity that you train them on enormously. Uh, one of my studies, I had one kid and my office at Georgia Tech is right in the middle of my lab. And I had one kid, and this was a study where we trained people, we had to come in, each subject came in for 23 days of training, 23 days. So you get to know your subjects, which in fact can be part of the problem. And I had this one subject, his name was Kyle, I'm going to give you his last name, he was a George Tech student, and, and on the working memory tasks that he was being trained on, he improved 23 standard deviations from day one. He went enormous, he became an expert. He became the world's expert on the operation span. Did he show any improvement on the Ravens? Nada, nothing, zero, not a bit of improvement. And that was really true in general. We found it over and over and over again. Now, I say that to, uh, to get to the attention control, because I think with attention control, which was what your question was about, Tiffany, I think that I, there are limits on my attention control. And, and I'm, I just told you my next birthday, I'll be 74. I was probably a low span when I was 24, but I'm certainly a low working memory, low attention control now relative to you. You're what, 22, 23? So there's, you know, but beyond that, there are these differences that are biological. I, I just, they are biological, but there are some important things that, uh, that I think are trainable. And so one summer, and this has been about five, six years ago, I spent my entire summer reading the works of a, uh, a Vietnamese Buddhist monk by the name of Thich Nhat Hanh. Anybody ever heard of Thich Nhat Hanh? Very famous, uh, Vietnamese Buddhist monk on mindfulness. And I thought, you know, of the people who know about how to control attention, Zen masters are it. I mean, they never had a psychology class probably, but they know how to control attention. You start with a breath and you go from there. And, and so 
I really have become convinced that that with training, I can get better and you can get better, but within your limits. Does that make sense? Now, let me give you an example of that. I referred to Adele Diamond a little bit ago. She's a developmental neuroscientist who was at the University of Massachusetts, Boston for many years, and is now at the University of British Columbia. <clears throat> and I, I used to talk to Adele a lot. We haven't talked in several years now, but in, in one of uh, our conversations, and she later wrote this in a paper, she talked about about something that Montessori schools do. She said that what Montessori schools do is they will put a piece of tape down a long hallway in the, in the school. And, and they, have, they play this game with their kids where kids have to walk down that tape and every foot, every step has to be on the tape. And if they, if they step off, they have to go back and start all over again. It's a game, right? And after they do that, they then give them a spoon and they have to carry that spoon down the full length of the tape, step by step by step. And after they get to the point where they're really good at that, they put water in the spoon. And now they have to carry the spoon with water in it. And she argues, Adele argues, that they do this to improve attention and control. And a week after Adele first told me that, I was in a car wash, I think, having my car washed. And there was a woman there who happened to be a teacher at a Montessori school. I said, well, do you do that? She said, yeah, we do that all the time. Adele argues that there are all of these procedures that, that, that society uses that are very effective in training attention. She talks about uh, circus training and dance training, both of which require enormous attention control. So I'm convinced that these procedures can make each of us better at, at attending and blocking distracting events because we, hang on. That tells me I'm, I've got an appointment with you guys in a little bit. Uh, but it's within these, these limits set by our biology. Does that make sense? So yeah, I think, I think we can get better, uh, but you're not going to take somebody who is biologically predisposed to have poor attention control and make them better than you know, then somebody at their at their peak who's who's biologically predisposed to have good attention control. I think what you can do is you can take somebody who's got really good attention control and and deprive them of sleep, make them worry, make them depressed, make them schizophrenic. <laughs> you go through the list and you can make them low attention control. It, that's easy. It's the other way around is that's the hard one, so. Yeah, I, I have uh, two very, very simple questions, but uh, 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 one is, uh, I take it, first of all, that uh, you don't agree with Daniel Connell uh, in his claim, basically, that nobody can do multitasking. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, well, let me the second one is just uh, a long, long time ago. Uh, I remember reading Hans Eysenck, and yeah. Eysenck argued that uh, simply the speed with which you could push a button in response to a stimulus uh, basically uh, correlated overwhelmingly with IQ. I'm wondering whether or not your research is the key to understanding Eysenck's claim. Okay, I have answers to both. Very good. Good, two good questions, by the way, two excellent questions. Um, I think attention is unitary. I, I don't think we have multiple attentions. And I think I'm either attending to something or not attending. But I also think that attention can be thought of conceived of like a spotlight. So very, very focused. You know, if you think about a, uh, I live, some of the people who came on early realize, know this, that I live in the mountains. I live right next to the Chattahoochee National Forest. And so, and, and it's a wilderness. I mean, my house is surrounded by wilderness. So if I go out at night here, I almost always have a headlight on, right? Well, my headlights, they either focus very small or they, they're broad. And if it's small, it's very intense around that small spot. But if I vary it, I can make it less intense over a bigger area. You know the type of light I'm talking about. Well, attention is very much like that, I think. And so <clears throat> all of that's going to impact whether we do multitasking. 
By and large, what we do is we shift quickly between one task and another. Bob, did, did you get that? Show me a head shake. Tell me you'd see it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I rely on that a lot. That and the eyebrow crunch. I have a built-in detector for that in a large class. So, so this is why the maintenance part of working memory is really important. So if I shift from talking to you, and now all of a sudden, Lynn or Robin over here on, my, on the left side of my screen asked me something, but then I want to get back to you. I have to remember what I was talking with you. What's your second question, right? I've got to remember that. So I have to maintain that while I shift away, think about something else, your first question, and then get back to remembering your first question. That's where the maintenance becomes important. But attention control is really important in all of those processes, I think. And so we clearly do multitasking. We just do it sequentially, attend to this, attend to this, attend to this. Now get back to this before I've lost that representation of what I was doing when I was there before. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Now, processing speed is a really interesting. There are people, particularly developmental people, uh, and, and I'm at Georgia Tech where you know we have all of these people who study the, the effects of aging on cognition. Tim Salthouse, my colleague who talked me into coming to Georgia Tech, he then left. Uh, among them. In my opinion, processing speed, you, how do you get processing speed? You have somebody do something like press a button when a red light comes on, different button when a green light comes on. That requires attention control. Momentary, momentary distraction. And, and it happens to me all the time. While I'm talking to you, there's a picture on my wall right above my monitor. I shifted my attention up there without moving my eyes. Well, Processing speed, and we've shown this in, in our recent studies, processing speed measures themselves are a function of attention control. Okay, now the, another problem with the processing speed, and I think wasn't the only one who's made that argument. I'm, I know, I didn't know Isaac well, but I met him on a couple of occasions. I'm old enough to have met a, a number of really old people in the field. Uh, but the real question, and, and the, the, this criticism comes from another Brit by the, uh, by the name of, uh, of Patrick Rabbit, who said, when I hear speed of processing, I immediately think, speed of what? Doing what? What is the speed of? Is it snappier neurons? Well, Arthur Jensen was a real big believer in that as well. What's he talking about? What's the speed of? You know, we don't say accuracy of. I mean, processing speed is just a dependent variable like accuracy. So I think processing speed is a is a bookmark actually for ignorance about what what is the what is the process that you think is faster or slower. Uh, when we put in estimates of processing speed in our study, which we we do the ASVAB study, for example, we have a, a measure of processing speed that does not account for that variance. In fact, if anything, attention control accounts for the variance in processing speed, not the other way around. Does that answer, answer your question? It's a good, two good questions. And they're both questions that my lab has dealt with a lot. I was interested in your distinction between sequential and simultaneous. Yeah. And, and sort of, if you could speak a bit more about that, you know, because, yeah. and, and, yep. you know, from, you know, I, I think about yep. it a lot in terms of sort of visual versus auditory. Yep. Yep. Um, well, and those two domains, you know, visual, is by and large information spread across space. Yeah. And, and auditory is almost by definition spread across time. So comparing those two is always tricky. Uh, so if you look at the loadings in that structural equation model, what you find is that, that the loadings for the auditory tasks and the visual tasks, while they both, they both, they form a coherent uh, latent variable, clean, counts for the data beautifully. The loadings for the two domains are different. And so we did a subset of subjects. Uh, the first study used the visual items were on the screen at the same time. And the loadings were not as high as the auditory. The auditory loaded very well. So that suggests that sequential is more important to this attention control than is spatial. Oh, and, yeah. and do you see my point? Yeah. And, and so, we did a subset of subjects where the 
the, the lines, for example, in the visual task came on sequentially, but we didn't do enough of those to get a very clean estimate. The, the estimates were higher. The, the loadings were a little bit higher, but I think that's an interesting question. And it might help to, to specify where attention control is important in these tasks. You know, ultimately what we psychologists do is we give people something to do. <laughs> and it's the thing that we give them to do that, that, you know, we just pull something off the shelf and say, well, this is a working memory test, or this is a intelligence test, or this is X, you know, when in fact, every test, every task, every test is different, and they're all multiply determined. And that's, so I think it, there are a lot of interesting questions that each of those studies raises at a, at a molecular level. And as I answered to Robin, you know, I'd love to have the time, the resources, the money to send a group of people off. You know, if I were the director of Mox Planck Institute and I had a hundred people working for me, I'd say, okay, you guys go and solve this problem about sequential and simultaneous, right? But I don't. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, is there, do we have any other questions? Um, we're getting kind of toward the end of our time. Um, one last question. It looks we're running out of electrons. Yeah, so we're running. <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly. Well, if not, I would uh, just thank you again. It's it's we have to have a, a you know sort of a virtual event to get, right. get across right. town like this yeah. or get yeah. across. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much, and we will we'll do another clap. You know, That's a virtual clap. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's it's been fun. I you know I always enjoy talking about my work, and uh, you know we at various times we Robin remembers this. We tried to start a some kind of group a discussion early years ago, but you know interestingly enough, it just Atlanta is hard to do that. It's a you know at one time when I, you know I was I came to Georgia Tech as chair and was chair for thirteen years, and at one time I had two colleagues, one that lived twenty five miles north of Georgia Tech. And another one lived 25 miles south of Georgia Tech. I mean, my God. I mean, how do you have department parties? How do you, how, <laughs> yeah. How do you, this, this thing that we started, you know, with Robin, and there were a number of people there that were from Emory and Georgia Tech and Georgia State. And it's such a, a shame that we couldn't get something like that started. But it's perfectly understandable to me. I mean, it's just, it's hard to do that in a big city. Yeah. I mean, if it takes like, 25 or 30 minutes to get anywhere and at any time, right? On, on a oh, it takes 25 minutes to find your car. I mean, that's right. That's right. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. So anyway, well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed it.